Uh, let me start, I'll start with the bit with the blackboard just to give a bit uh, zoom out for an overview of what we are doing, why we are doing it. And then because I had everything already prepared in slides for a talk that I had to give last week, I'll go to the slides. Uh, so our main aim in this program is try to understand CFTs and specific acting CFTs, try to understand holography and how holography comes about. Now, when trying to do this, it's very useful to uh, consider more solvable, take limits and things simplified. And of course, the limit that I would only focus on in this lecture is the toothed large and limit. Now, the nice thing about this limit is that the theory is still interacting and capturing a lot of, not all, but part of the general physics and the general structure, but yet is much more tractable. But by itself, it's not enough. What I will do also is try to consider in the tooth large and limit to consider the most tractable interacting CFT in four dimensions. That it's still capturing the, the uh, idea of uh, weakly strongly coupled in holography. I try to convince you in this talk that this uh, fishnet model is an example of such theory and we can really do things very precise and really derive the holographic map in this case. Um, <clears throat> so what are we hope to learn for that exactly? What are the general lessons we hope to learn by studying a specific model? And the general lesson I want that, yes, 19 of we, there was one paper in March and the rest is not yet published. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, <laughs> so what I hope to, to learn from solving a specific model is try to understand basically how our uh, holography, for example, comes about in general. Means what is the map between the bulk and the boundary uh, degrees of freedom? And more specifically, how because you can you can map any Hilbert space to any Hilbert space by itself is not contentful. Really, something that contentful about ADS-CFT is that the dual description is uh, local in the bulk. I want to see the emergence of locality uh, at strong capping. And the uh, last thing I want to learn is how to compute the interaction, how to compute correlation function uh, in this model, how, how to learn general lessons, how to do it in general CFTs. So this will be more about the last talk. But let me, uh, because here we're focusing on the planar limit, let me, I think it's emphasized to saying what, what do we hope to learn in the planar limit? What is, what is the essence of planar holography? Okay. So uh, the essence of planar holography is first a dual description that become classical at strong coupling. At strong coupling, you can do computation just by solving classical equation of motion. This is uh, one general expectation for it. And the second one is the emergence of locality. But of course, we are in the planar limit here. So there are no no black holes or any black hole physics. This is finite n effect. What I mean by locality at the uh, uh, planar limit is basically a, log a locality on the world sheet. Okay? That we have a description in terms of a smooth world sheet in higher dimensional uh, space time. The world sheet is to start with just given by its action, given by the area, by the Nabugoto action, and there are local interactions on the world sheet. This, I think, is the, es the first essence of uh, locality in the planar limit. And then when you go to higher order in one over n, it will be the locality of the interaction in the bulk. More than perturbatively, I expect locality to be related to graviton scattering, but this is already one over n effect. Okay. At the planar limit, it's locality on the world sheet. And if we're going to derive such a thing, more, more precisely, you'll find a discretized version of a world sheet in ADS. So just for uh, the plan of this talk, so they told me to rotate it for the camera. So uh, what I'm going to, to do today is to first give a really short crash review of the fishnet model, which will be this, the claim the simplest CFT in four dimensions that we can do a lot of progress in trying to understand uh, general structure. And then we'll go and derive its holographic dual headstone capping. It will be only a classical description. Mm -hmm. 
tomorrow we are going to uh, go and take this classical description and quantize it. So just to remind you for um, usual strings dual to n equal to 4, what we are used to, there are some operators that we can describe classically by minimal surface in ADS. But then beyond that, one can do just uh, semi-classical, first order in 1 over lambda. Here we will be able to do all orders. And in the last talk, which is a bit separate from these two that are related to holography, I'll talk about correlation function. Now we can use this model to study general structure of correlation function, and in particular how to use integrability techniques for computing them. Questions? Um, want to go to the slides now? So, um, <laughs> ah, you know what? Uh, it's okay. I'll use this. I'll use the slides of the blackboard. I'll do a bit more on the on the blackboard. Then. So I want to, to uh, <laughs> describe a bit the fishnet model. Now the, the fishnet model, if uh, in my view at least, two alternative descriptions. One description that I'll, it will be the, maybe the center of the last talk is just is not a different theory, but just consider. Uh, a specific type of uh, observables in n equal to 4. So, you write a bit. Fishnet. Description 1 is some, it will be some uh, limit of what we will call twist operators in. What are the other uh, more uh, standard description is in terms of a CFT on its own right. Okay? And this CFT uh, was uh, <coughs> first derived by uh, Kazakov and Gordanov. It <laughs> was derived by uh, taking a double scaling limit of what is called gamma deformed n equal to 4 superior limit. Now, gamma deformation, so uh, double scaling limit. gamma deformation. So what is gamma deformation? Gamma deformation in general is uh, some twist in the way the interaction in n equal to 4 take place. And in general, it has uh, three parameters. For simplicity, I will only consider one parameter subfamily of this three parameter uh, family. So in this one parameter family, one can uh, Describe it, for example, is uh, taking a term in the interaction in n equal to 4, which is uh, for a <laughs> two complex scalar interaction that can be written as okay, so phi 1, phi 2 square. So phi 1 and phi 2 are two complex colors. Of course, these are all n by n uh, matrices. And to uh, deform it, into the trace, give one phase to one order in an opposite phase, theta one to the other ordering, phi one, phi two, minus e to the minus i, theta one, phi two, phi one. Okay. So in general, there are three parameters, you could call them theta one, theta two, and theta three, that uh, do such a twist. You'll turn in only one of them amount to doing this deformation of the four scalar interaction in n equal to four. Now, the Fishnet uh, limit, okay, maybe before that. In general, when you do this uh, deformation, naively you preserve uh, conformality, but in fact, in general, you break conformality, you induce double trace operators, so on, and there, will be, there have been a lot of uh, literature on that, and in the sub-manifold of the three parameters, there are some special points that you have uh, conformal symmetry. Not what we are going to do here. Here we're going just to take a double scaling limit of, it, of uh, this deformation, which will turn out to be conformal in the planar limit. 
if it remains conformal beyond the, the planar limit, this is yet to be shown. Okay? And probably I want to tune uh, some interactions, yes. This work all supersymmetry. <laughs> have no supersymmetry at all. The, the way we will do it will work all, uh, okay. So generally there are three parameters and they are corresponding uh, the formation of the inter the recover interaction with the fermions. And in this three parameter family, there is one line which is supersymmetric. Basically where well, this theta one equal to theta two equal to theta three. Okay. What we're considering here is turning only one of them, so you work supersymmetry completely from the very beginning. Yes. I think so, yes. And one other nice uh, property, especially of the beta deform, is that it preserves integrability in the planar limit. And indeed, the model we're going to get will be integrable. And we will show that. Right interaction where all the beta functions are zero up to order one over n. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, good point. So, in general, the gamma these deformations they had an uh, holographic uh, description, but the limit that I'm going to take in this holographic description is very singular. And this is why it uh, prevented uh, a derivation of an holographic dual for this model. However, there is uh, this description one to get to. But if you follow it, the holographic description is quite uh, transparent, I think. But it was not done yet. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll describe it in the, in the last talk how to start from string theory that dual to n equal to four and arrive at the model that we will derive by the formation of them. So I'll discuss this when discussing the, this description. So, uh, so the double uh, scaling limit uh, <coughs> that uh, we are going to take is the, the limit where the original uh, toothed coupling in GN square times n will be taken to zero but at the same time, this twist parameter theta is taken to i times infinity, such that the combination that I'll call psi square, and maybe with some factor of four pi, yes. So let me add here four pi square is equal to lambda e to two i theta. What stands here? Uh, no, to the i theta. We kept fixed. So basically, if you look on this interaction, out of the four terms, you pick, you keep only one of them. It doesn't matter, it's either one. Mm -hmm. Oh, here, yes, in this one. Yeah? This grow, yes. Thank you. So, what is the action that remains for n equal to four? All the interaction, everything goes away, apart from the term that scale as e to the minus two i theta, which is this term. So, yes. To start with, theta was real. But the moment that we take it to be complex, then this interaction term already is not an remission operator anymore. So the theory indeed will be non-unitary. Okay. Also, in this description, this is why I emphasize it's also this equivalent description. You're not deforming the theory, you're just looking at some uh, specific operators.
What's the problem? Okay, we have to, I think one has to. Uh, I think you're forcing me a bit to uh, jump ahead, but uh, um, I think one has to. You know, we're talking about the planar limit. Okay. So from the string, if you start from normal string in ADS, uh, for example, what, what would happen, it would be that you put a boundary condition that you put up, you go around, you don't come back to the same point. And these two points will be related by some boost on the sphere. Okay, this is the complex data, not by rotation, but by a boost. So the scalars are complex to start with. This is a symmetry of the model, but as a result, the spectrum will not be real, for example. But from the world sheet point of view, it will be still normal uh, description in ADS. The norm on the world sheet would be a positive, uh, well-defined norm. The Hilbert space will be, the standard Hilbert space will just twist it by putting some complex boundary condition that will force the spectrum not to be real. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly what I'm going to write. So let's write the action. So just a, uh, two scalars, these two, d phi one. Square plus square plus this four scalar interaction. So all the gauge field, all the, all the fermions, everything decouples. Really, and just with these two complex scalars, one for scalar interaction, and we are interested in the planar limit where uh, this n is going to infinity, and <coughs> this chiser, this is like the toothed coupling. Kept fixed. Impose Gauss loop. Corresponding to which? Oh, yeah, I would only. Again, there were three complex scalars, and in this limit that uh, that we took, we only keep this one term in the action, and the third scalar decouples. Now, the, this double scaling limit there is a three parameter family. So remember, there were three thetas, and we can scale all of them together to I infinity. So in general, there are such freak size, not just one, and the model has also fermions. But no gauge field. So I expect that everything I'll say today can be generalized to the full model, but here we are only going to focus on this simple one. And in particular, there is also this n equal to one so, uh, supersymmetric line in this three parameter model, even in this limit. No supersymmetry. Uh, <coughs> so Right, no supersymmetry. And uh, in general, for four count, there is also a, a double trace uh, term here, which coefficient for work out ex explicitly. But this double trace uh, term is, is turned out to be completely irrelevant at finite coupling. It's just a contact term for operator of size two in perturbation theory. But the moment that you go beyond perturbation theory, you can forget about it. It will not contribute at all. And therefore, I will ignore it in the rest of the talk. Again? No. 
it's not suppressed in, in, the, in the one over n. It contributes at linear order in one over n, but only for operator of length two that have, uh, only operator that will have, let's say, trace of two phi's. And on, it's uh, some only contact term in perturbation theory. When you go, it's spectral uh, decomposition just uh, supported uh, zero coupling. Yes. Beyond that, doesn't doesn't contribute at all. Okay, so I will just ignore it, and everything else will be correct. Yeah. In, right. The 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 other. Uh, if you turn on the other. So this is like I one. If you turn on the other two, they come with you cover interaction and fermions. I just did. There is a there is a manifold of uh, three dimensional manifold, and this is just one line in it. You can pick other line that has the fermion. There is. Not, not for this one, not for this one, but you keep another one that has a you cover interaction. This is right. So the other model in general, they have fermions and you cover interaction with the fermions, but only one and not the complex conjugate one. Metrics model. But these are, uh, these are still, uh, four dimensional fields. Yeah. But you compute the beta functions and they are zero up to order one over n. The beta function, so the beta function would be the, the beta function for this guy and uh, the beta function for other, in general, there are uh, some, uh, two types of double trace operators and you have to tune the uh, uh, the coefficients so that the theory is conformal. This was done, but it's really not relevant. Yeah, I will go to it in the slides in, in, in a second. Yeah. Right. So the, the, there is only, if I, if I draw this interaction here, there is only one type of interaction where let's say, this arrow is the phi one charge, and this arrow is the phi two charge, but there is no the conjugate one. So for example, if I'm trying to correct the propagator, the, this is not there because it includes one normal vertex, but one conjugate one in the planar limit. The nice one thing about, nice, nice about this model is that you have comparatively very simple diagrammatic. If you are at any order in perturbation theory, there is at most one diagram. So if there is one diagram, the diagram itself is already physical. Usually it's gauge dependent and so on. Here you can really attach physics to a single diagram. So that's a nice one. Uh, can I uh, start with the slides? The action is not real. No. There are also in condensed matter, there are many uh, non-unitary uh, CFTs uh, that they are very interested, but I will not go there. For our purpose of trying to understand uh, CFTs in the planar limit, this is a very useful exercise because you can think about it as an anti continuation of the, the same structure. You don't have a mission on uh, Miltonian on the CFT. Turn out that you do have an emission on Miltonian on the world sheet. Oh, in a sense. So uh, this is uh, in few words what, what I was describing, but maybe one before going into any details, really what we're going to do is, is to derive an holographic description. And really this requires some uh, new idea that was not, why it was not done before. 
And if you're trying to zoom out, think what is the new idea, what new about here, you're trying to think about really the safety wave function that is dual to local operators. Really, turn out that in this model, you can easily characterize it very explicitly. In general, if you try to do that in n equal to 4, one have to fix a gauge, and it's a very complicated thing. Here, turn out that we can do it rather simply. And I think this is the general lesson that you will then go and try to generalize this one and try to think more carefully about the wave function in radial quantization that is dual to local operators. This is what we will do for this model. So these are the two descriptions. Here the uh, action, and what we said, conformal, integrable. I, I didn't talk about it. I will all, and then also talk, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why this model that we will derive is, is integrable, but we will not talk much in details about uh, integrability. It will not be the main focus on this part. Uh, <coughs> okay, so uh, wh why, why to start with we expect this model to be holographic at all? So people went and did computation, compute the spectrum and the structure constants in this model. And it turned out that the energy for some operator scale is Xi. You remember Xi is the square root of the two coupling. This is the exactly the scaling that you expect for a classical uh, string description in ADS. And similarly, the correlation function, the three-point function, scale like an exponent of minus square root of the tooth coupling times some uh, function of the conformal cross ratios. So this is exactly how you expect holographically to emerge at strong coupling. So given that, uh, suppose the model is indeed uh, holographic, how do we expect its holographic description to look like? So let me now just do as a side remark before going into any details. What happens if we start from strings dual to operator, single trace operator in n equal to four, and try to take the corresponding double scaling limit? So uh, <laughs> this is in n equal to four. For simplicity, we will talk about what uh, we call the U1 sector. U1 sector is just the name for operator that carry a charge and the rotation of the scalars in the plane that correspond to the scalar uh, phi one, but are completely neutral under the other scalars in any case. It's just a choice that can be uh, then lifted. So if you want to describe the string worksheet that is dual to such an operator at strong coupling and in the classical limit, you have to write a worksheet action that have square root of the tooth coupling outside. And here you have ADS five. So this is ADS five written in embedding coordinate. So just six dimensional flat coordinate, and eta here is Lagrange multiplier that in, implies that x square is equal to minus r square. And it's also, you yeah, have dynamics on this circle on the, on the sphere, so you have to add here one uh, scalar that describe uh, this circle. And when you do that, you get uh, this behavior for the energy and the correlation function in the classical strong coupling limit. Now, By here or here? Yeah, this one. This is uh, an angle on the five, on S5. The one that corresponds to the, the scalar phi one. Rotation of phi one is rotation around this angle on the, on the sphere. That's the circle. Now, what happens when you take the uh, classical limit? Classical limit, the, the fishnet limit, by taking the original tooth coupling, which is basically the radius of ADS in unit of string scale, to zero. So the string kind of become tensionless. But at the, <laughs> but at the same time, we will uh, we'll take the twist to infinity. So what I want to claim is that in this limit, the string basically will not see anymore the radius of ADS, because the radius of ADS becomes zero in units of string scale. One simple way to see it is do, to do this uh, the scaling of the parameter, and now when we send lambda to zero, you see that term um, uh, scale, that or not. So what we end is with a string that is only propagating on the light cone in embedding space. It's just blind to the ADS radius because it's so small compared to the string uh, scale. But at the same time, we are taking uh, the twist uh, to infinity, this theta to infinity, the string can have still large extension on the sphere and still become classical. If we tune the parameter correspondingly, what we expect to end with is a classical description, but not in ADS, but on the light cone, which is still five dimensional. Okay. 
One sector of operator, you mean? We will refer to the carry only charge under phi one rotation. Yeah. At the classical limit, this is all you need to capture it. Yeah. The n equal to four theory or the fishnet model. Yeah. So uh we're going to do, this is just heuristic, just to give some intuition what to expect. When we are going to do the fishnet, we are going to uh, consider a similar operator that will just not be uh, phi free here. But everything I say can almost trivially generalize to any operator. Okay, it's just a simplified assumption. It's not essential to, to any, any step in the derivatives. And uh, this is a paper that we are writing now. Oh, can you repeat? Let, let me uh, postpone the answer to this question because what we are going to do next is to study the spectrum of operator in this model and then we, let, let me comment about that, okay? So now, now uh, <laughs> let's formulate the problem. Here is the action and what we want to derive is a strong coupling description of it. Classical description means that the dual actions should have the toothed coupling. One, it's one over H bar is the toothed coupling. Okay. So when you can take it to be large, you have to solve it only classically. Okay. That will be the aim of the talk today. So again, I'll study the analog operators in the fishnet model. So this is operators that, for simplicity, do not carry charge under phi two rotation. So the model have two internal global symmetries, which are rotation of the two complex scalars, and we only consider operators that are charged under one, but not charged under the other. This is not uh, very important. Uh, Restriction. And the, the position can have any number of operators distributed in any other way. So this is just basis of, uh, in all possible order in here, of operator of this type. And you can pick also other bases. Instead of uh, spreading near derivatives, you can think about as some point splitting uh, regularization by separating the points. And when you Taylor expand this axis, let's say around the origin, you get back the same operator. So considering this operator with arbitrary number of derivatives or this operator with no derivatives, but you separate the scalars, it's just a different basis of the same space of operators. Now, what is uh, nice about this model, you have a very nice diagrammatic. So what I want to do now is consider what is the state that is dual to such a local operator in the operator state correspondence in the CFT. So here is the original operator, it's a trace of some set of scalars, can have several phi ones, and phi two only come in a neutral pairs. Turn out that to uh, probe such an operator in this model, all I have to do is to compute this correlation function with j phi one scalars here at location x one to xj. I need to do now a perturbation theory to compute this correlation function between our operator and J conjugate scalars, okay? find out that you only have this type of Feynman diagrams. So in first order in perturbation theory, all the phi twos have to contract with each other. This is the only diagram that contributes. This contraction just modify here a bit the wave function. But at the end of the day, you end only with phi one uh, sources. And then, Yes, the, the, uh, this, the, this is a number, right? Or it, this is a correlation function computed by uh, this correlation function. If I give you all this correlation function for any, for any value of x1 to xj, you can tell me which operator stands here. That's the state. Okay, so to characterize, well, this is a basis, if you can think about it, as a basis of the Hilbert space in radial quantization. So uh, here the black lines are phi 1 propagators, the red lines are phi 2 propagators, and this 
cross points are the, these four uh, scalar interaction points. They are interaction points that are, have to be integrated over four dimensions. For example, when you add here one more wheel, you have to add two J propagators and to do J, inter, J integration over four dimensions over J inter, interaction purposes. You add J loops. Okay? So this is just a, a way of uh, graphically describing all the type of Feynman diagrams that contribute here. The point here is that once you have a Phi 2, it cannot move back and interact again. Okay? Because there is only one vertex that's not to conjugate, and we are in the planar limit, its only option is to continue. If it will go back, it will be non-planar, or it would require the conjugate vertex that is, not, that is absence. It can not also go in because there is no uh, Phi 2 or 4 vertex interaction. Yeah, just because of charge conserv uh, conservation. Okay? Phi 1 rotation is a global symmetry, and here we are looking on an operator with a given charge. If you would have phi one, phi one, they go here, they would have to uh, alienate directly. But if, if you are taking a phi one, phi one, they go here, there will just be nothing. You just have the free propagation, and that's it, no loop corrections at the planar limit. This is the only operator that have some dynamics. Okay. If I have both phi one and phi one dagger, I cannot wrap any phi two around because it's phi one vertex and then it's continuous. In this model, these are the only non-trivial operator, and these are the only diagrams that contribute to it. This is what's so nice about it. Really? Yes. So you can also put here, if you want, phi 2, phi 2 dagger, but this does not enlarge the space. It just, uh, let's look here. If I had here phi 2, phi 2, phi 2, and phi 2 daggers, I just here, here like inserting another phi 1 and give it some wave function. Okay? So it's just a different basis or the well, just on a basis this is a complete basis. So our main uh, study in this model will be study this correlation function. Okay, how we probe local operator in the sector with charge j. You see? In other words, if I give you this function for any j, you can tell me which operator stands for it. It's a different way of saying the same thing. Now uh, You ask what is the norm in this space? This will be the last slide. <laughs> yeah. uh, this was, uh, by the way, this was never uh, viewed in this way. In, you would not find this statement in a single published paper, maybe until in a few days. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what is uh, nice about it is now I want to talk about uh, what is called the graph building operator. Graph building operator is an operator that take this wave function, take this graph, and add to it another layer of phi 2. So, uh, yes. Here, this is phi 1, and this is a propagator. So it, let's start the tree level. The tree level is just a free propagator between these two points. Okay. And then get loop corrected. General, you will sum. <coughs> yeah, phi one. Think about it a bit in the double line notation. So these are traced together. Phi one is just uh, a line here. Yes. Yes. These are interaction points, and these y points. This is exactly what is written here. This y point, this interaction point, it will be integrated over four dimensions. Or in momentum space, you have to integrate over four momentum if you want in momentum space. Here I'll keep working in position space for synthesis. The important point is that there are no other diagrams. These are the only diagrams in the planar limit. 
but they are still very complicated. In general, we don't know how to compute such complicated integrals. Let me introduce what's called the, the graph building operator. The graph building operator is, is taking this correlation function, square function, and add to it one more wheel. So it is a, a product of J uh, red phi 2 propagator, product of J phi 1 propagator to the next external point, and integration J four dimensional integration over the interaction points. And here we have just the three propagators, one over x minus y squared. So this y, y plus one are the external propagate, are the operator that running around the wheel. This y minus x are the one that pointing to the next external points. Okay. I know that this is a very uh, nice operator to consider. And what I want to uh, convince you next would be a few uh, technical uh, steps. But the, the basic, the bottom line would be that physical operator in the theory, meaning operator with a good conformal primary operator with a good conformal dimensions are in one-to-one -one correspondent to stationary wave function under the graph building operator. Okay? You may ask which wave function, when you act on them with a graph building operator, you get back the same wave function with coefficient one. This will exactly give you the quantization condition. and will tell you which dimensions are allowed in the model. Okay? Let me try to argue why it is true in some details. Okay? It's not clear this is the bottom line of what I'm going to discuss next. Yes, this is what we will do now, exactly. Yes. So the nice thing is that if you want to resum all the wheels, it's become just a, a geometric sum in this uh, B operator. Okay. Yeah, the, one another wheel of phi tools interact. Here, if we are studying the, the correlator, we have here the, just the, these first propagators. But under them, we have just to compute the complete basis and to insert this geometric sum inside. Okay? So this is already a, a formal way of writing the full summation of perturbation theory. Okay? Now, when you, when you see such an expression, the natural thing to do is to go and diagonalize B, of course. Right? Because B is a complicated integral operator that stands here in the numerator, in order to make sense of it, we must put now a complete base of eigenstates of this graph building operator. So what we are going to do is to insert a complete basis of B. Now, B, remember, is, is a conform, this is a conformal theory in the plan argument. So any, any of this four-dimensional integral had four scalar propagating going out of it, meaning B was a conformal operator. So it's better commute with all the conformal generators, meaning that we can characterize his eigenstate also by a dimension and spin. Okay. So I'll uh, describe his eigenstate, not just his eigenstate of the building of the graph building operator with some energy, but also an eigenstate of in, simultaneously of the dilatation operator and of uh, spin rotation. So uh, what we know this spectrum, now the correlation function become uh, <coughs> just this uh, formula where here we put a complete basis and we know how to put a complete basis of dilatation and rotation. This is just partial wave decomposition of this correlator function, nothing more uh, fancy than that. And the fact that we have to resum the wheels here and enter in this non-trivial dependence on the dimension and the speed. Okay. So originally when you put a complete basis, you think about the radial mode as right, this e to the uh, r, and just put uh, plane waves there. Okay? So this uh, dimension is not real. It's uh, started uh, in four dimension. It's equal to two plus imaginary part. Okay? Just harmonic analysis without any dynamics. What you do, you go and you close this contour of integration here. And then where the non-trivial dynamic center is where are the poles in this integral. This is where the dependence on the model, where the physics center. The rest is completely kinematical. Yes. Nothing to do with just a name. Okay. Maybe I should have called it, give it a, a different name. Some labeling of the I of the eigenvectors, eigenstates of this this uh, integral operator.
why shouldn't they be real? It's, uh, okay, we can go to that at the end, we discuss the norm, but this is a self-adjoint operator with respect to the norm. You see, it's not so non-unitary. The planar limit is like the, the world sheet is still a good norm in unitary. It's just some global thing that's break. It's just because you generate conformal integrals, right? Or any, any uh, four-dimensional integration point is connected to four propagators. So if you actuate with, with a conformal generator, its weight is exactly canceled by the, I don't know, yeah, I prefer not to go more details. So you see automatically that the, where the physics end is exactly where are the poles in this integral, and these are exactly where the eigenvalues hit one. Okay? This is how you go from the partial wave decomposition of this correlation function to its conformal block decomposition. Uh, oh, so, we, uh, sorry. so we concluded that uh, physical operators, right in the spectrum of the model, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with wave functions that are stationary under the graph building operator. Let's do an, one example, the simplest example, on, on, almost simplest example in, uh, in details. So this is the case of j equal to 2 in operator with two phi 1 interactions. In that case, the, the wave function is just a function of two scalars. All of it carries off. Uh, you mean the theory is not, not unitary. That's correct. Okay. The, when, you, when we have to solve, so you have this equation. Okay. These are all real functions. These are all real functions for uh, real uh, uh, lambda and s. But when you go and ask where are the roots of this equation, which is exactly what we're going to do for an example, you find that the roots are not on the real line. The roots are for complex delta for a fixed s. It's a self-adjoint operator with respect to the relevant norm that uh, is input. The Hamiltonian, the four-dimensional Hamiltonian, no, the Lagrangian is not real. There is some norm in which B is a self-adjoint operator, yes. We know. And we'll go to it. It's a natural norm of the, yes. Yes. Uh, let's create a This is, I think so, yes, but I don't think it's such a relevant question. So, that's why I'm uh, you know, actually, the, the, this uh, norm stuff we're going only to discuss at the end of the talk tomorrow. So, I, I think it's better to get some experience before uh, going there. We just add, add J loops, basically, add one more wheels. Yeah, but here what we are doing is with some perturbation theory. Mm -hmm. There's nothing uh, strange about uh, <laughs> this uh, operator, it's just you know, one way to write, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead, but one way to write the norm is to uh, here. is equal to uh, this is already J. And this is one way to uh, write the norm. And this operator written that way is, is obviously self-adjoint. This is really way, way ahead. We concluded uh, that uh, physical operator corresponds to stationary wave function with respect to this graph building operator. I want to see it explicitly for the simple example, which is operator of a length two, meaning uh, charge two. 
this case, the wave function is just a function of two variables. And if it has a given uh, dimension and conformal spin, this is fixed uniquely by conformal symmetry. You don't have to do anything. It's just given basically by the three-point function of two scalars and one operator of dimension delta and spin s. So given by this structure, and for uh, s that is not zero, there is some tensor structure here. Okay. To compute the spectrum now, all we have to do is to take this explicit wave function that is fixed by conformal symmetry and act on it with the graph building operator. And when you do so, you find uh, and equate the energy to one to find the corresponding, uh, what happened? The corresponding spectrum. You find two non-trivial operators. The spectrum is given by this equation and they differ by the sign of uh, plus and minus. They correspond to what is called twist two and twist four operators. One of them is trace by one square and the other is trace by one box by one. These are the two operators. And uh, when, once you do it, you can also get the corresponding structure constant of this correlation function. You get it completely, and they are known, uh, get them explicitly. So the non-relevant uh, data for us, and we are interested in the strong coupling limit, would be the limit where uh, psi, the tooth coupling, is going to infinity. And we can also take the, the spin to, to scale to infinity together to have some uh, state with non-trivial spin at strong coupling. And you see that the corresponding spectrum just become that at strong coupling because there is psi to the four here. And uh, also the correlation function, which the full correlation function that I didn't write explicitly, takes this exponential form where theta and rho, uh, so here we are studying four point correlation function of four scalars, two scalars on one trace, two scalars on another trace. So this uh, theta and rho are just two independent conformal cross ratios that characterize this four-point function. And those are the two cross ratios that are most natural to the center of mass frame. So if I go into the frame where the two operators are standing like that, theta is the angle and e to the rho is the distance, okay? And this one is scaled to one. Okay. This is just ba a basis of two independent conformal cross ratio that is enough to characterize the four-point function. What is rho? Rho is a conformal cross ratio okay, of the four points. Rho stands here, is a conformal cross ratio. But in the center of mass frame where this length is one, this is e to the rho. Okay? So here are these two operators on one trace, these two operators are on the other trace. Why am I writing it? Because when I, if we are going to uh, derive now a holographic description, it better reproduce this result for j equal to two in the classical limit. Okay. So this is going to be one of the tests. Questions? Let's take the, the one with um, the one with twist two, which is trace phi square. In n equal to four, it's a BPS operator. It's protected. In any oh, psi equal to zero, it's just a three level. It's, a, it's not. Uh, Contentful expression, just a free theory. Just two for three scalar propagators. In the third talk, we <laughs> jump in ahead. We, we, we will get this by starting in n equal to four with, say, this operator, and then adding a twist operator. We will uh, compute two point function or after regulation, a regularization, a four point function, and take some limit. Not a three point it's a three point function. So if you think about the fishnet uh, model by itself, the scalar is a good operator. Okay, there's no gate symmetry. So in that sense, we are computing a four point function 
in the in the fish network. What physically what you want to think about it is that we are really trying to study the spectrum within the two point function of single trace operator when we did the point splitting. Okay. So this ends my uh, introduction. I try only to do a lot of work and uh, integrability and so on about the fishnet model. This will be the only relevant uh, information for us. Focus on it. Okay. What is special about delta? Delta and This is the spectrum of conformal dimensions of the operator. This, uh, these are, uh, that's why I didn't bother even to write them, there are some ratio of gamma functions. There would be the three point function in the fishnet model between, when you think about the scalars themselves as a good operator. There's no gauge symmetry here. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Yeah, this is why I, I didn't push in this. Uh, yeah. okay. But uh, if you want the, the fishnet by itself, think about it as non unitary CFT. It has spectrum, it has three point functions, and these are the three point functions you can read from it. No, it's a, this three point function is a three point function between two scalar and uh, a, a, an operator of, of length two. Of UN. Oh, the, the scalars, they have, yes, here we, we, we try. We traced the, the, the scalar indices. Or you can you can leave them open, but it will be the same. It will be the same. It it will be the same in this case. It doesn't matter. Wait. You know, here we are taking one of them is trace phi one, the trace of two phi's. This is uh, UN invariant. Yes. The other two scalars as indices. Yes. Now we study it in the planar limit. Yes, yes. These are just three. You can trace them and just get a number, but if you pick, keep them open, it will be just the same number up to a uh, 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 trivial factor. You get delta i i one j two delta j two i one. Yes. You know some of them or not some of them, but in the planar limit, this is the only. Uh, this is a bit going in the uh, off direction because thinking about these scalars as a good operator is not what is going to lift if we're going away from this uh, uh, double scaling limit, which is what we want to do. So uh, this we are done with the introduction. This all the introduction. What I want to do now is to go and derive a dual distribution. And for that, we, what we <laughs> convince ourselves that good physical operator in the spectrum are in one to one corresponding with stationary wave function under this graph building operator. Where the kernel of the graph building operator is just this product of the propagator in the wheel and the spokes that go outside. The basic idea for the derivation is to try to think about this equation as an Hamiltonian equation that comes from a time reparameterization symmetry. When you think about uh, this equation, again, as an Hamiltonian equation, where what is the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is uh, B minus 1. But let me write it in a bit more uh, nice form. 
basically let me invert the graph built-in operator. So if you uh, take this b minus one and act on it with the product of the Laplacian of boxes for all the uh, <coughs> for all the external points, and use the fact that Repropagator is basically the green function for a box. So if you act on it in the box, you get a delta function. So what this box does when it acts on the graph building operator is killing all the integration in the loop and localize them at the same point. So what you get is just a product of the propagator, the spokes that go outside. Okay? And then the boxes that act on the one just give you like uh, a product of J kinetic terms. So we'll think about this, this condition is uh, a constraint that comes from a model with, which has time reparameterization symmetry, where this was the Hamiltonian of it. And this will generate time translation, which is non physical. So, if this, this is the, the Hamiltonian, what is the Lagrangian? So, if I just uh, transform from gender transform from the Hamiltonian to the Lagrangian, so here is the Lagrangian written fully with the uh, <coughs> gamma here. You think about it as square root of the world line metric. So to have weight one under time reparameterization on this uh, <coughs> fictitious time. On, think about it as the time on a line. You see, if you do uh, time reparameterization, gamma here exactly absorbs the weight of the kinetic term, but we have a gamma here outside. So in total, this action is time reparameterization invariant. And this Hamiltonian is just the Hamiltonian of this action that comes as a constraint by gauge fixing gamma to one. See, this action is look a bit uh, weird. The kinetic term is just a product of J kinetic terms. And it has this uh, crazy fractional power. Also the interaction look quite crazy, it's a product of all the propagators, product of all the interactions. Okay. In a moment, we will massage it a bit and bring it to a more, much more uh, standard form. It looks like a world line of a particle, a, a time, a world line symmetry of a particle, yes. But we will have, we have J particles, yes. but they're all sharing the same time. Yeah. So far, we are just following uh, our nose and uh, we're giving interpretation of this equation. I'm given a world line theory whose Hamiltonian constraint is equivalent to the physical constraint. Again, I think tomorrow we will get more close to what uh, we want. But today I'm just going to follow this. So again, this was just a gauge fixing. So uh, think about uh, this is like the Polyakov. Uh, form of, of the I'm going to derive a model that 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 have to be classical at strong coupling and live in higher dimensional space time which is going to be the light cone of embedding space. But this was why I didn't do that. But let's go slower. So if this is the uh, Polyakov form of the action, we can go to the Nabugoto form, which instead of gate fixing the world line metric to one, we integrate it out. And it's straightforward to integrate uh, gamma out. And what you get is this action. So not a few uh, things about it. First of all, where is the coupling? The coupling was uh, before here. It's a very high power. Here it just stand exactly outside as it's expected. Whatever this model describes is already satisfied that it's strong coupling. All we have to do is to solve the classical equation of motions that follow from it. Now, the, the action here it looks like a product of J kinetic terms and interactions with some uh, funny uh, fractional power. What, what are the, the symmetries of uh, this action? 
So first it has the original gauge, which is the time reparameterization symmetry. It's manifestly invariant under Lorentz transformation, under uh, rotation of the X, but maybe less manifest, this model has full, full conformal symmetry. This action is invariant under special conformal transformation or inversions, which is not surprising because it comes from describing the conformal operator, which was the graph building operator. This four line, particle, this four -line action is full conformal symmetry, which is not very manifest as written here. So what I want to do next is to go to a different coordinate, which would be embedding coordinates, that make all the symmetries manifest. Okay. It's J particles living with one line, one time at the same time, yes. Yes. Yeah, maybe let me give now some heuristic thing. Uh, I think this is a bit too, too early. If, if you start, suppose this was ADS 5. Okay? And you start in N equal to 4 and you consider some uh, classical string in this model that, let's say, have large spin also. If it have a uh, large spin, it would be uh, described by some string with Casper that rotates around. Okay. Now the corresponding uh, <laughs> operator that we are studying here also have a large char have a charge on the sphere, they, and they would have even twist on the sphere, meaning that this what will happen these bits here correspond to points where the string extend extend a lot on the sphere. Now what happened when we take the uh, Schnitt limit is that this piece of the string become tensionless because R radiates in unit string length going to zero. And you can, so it's become very uh, quantum, and you can integrate it out, and it leads to uh, basically to this nearest neighbor interaction. But these bits will still stay, become, stay classical because when you tune the uh, <laughs> um, lambda to zero, at the same time making them extend a lot of the sphere. You can start with BMN, do this twist, take the limit, and arrive at it. I expect it. It was not done. Uh, this is just an intuitive uh, picture for you. Wait a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> exactly where we're going. So what I want to do now, and you see that, try to make the symmetry as manifest as possible. Okay. In order to that, we, we go to embedding space. Embedding space of flat space. Okay? So just introducing uh, six flat coordinates with signature minus and the rest pluses. For simplicity, I'm just working in Euclidean uh, flat four-dimensional space. You consider the light cone in this uh, space. Basically, flat space is the projective light cone in embedding space. And to get the flat metric, one just have to set x plus, which is x minus one plus x zero, to one, and the rest four coordinates are just equal to the other four coordinates. If this is just a change of coordinates, uh, let me plug it back into the action before. Now, before doing that, there are two uh, useful identities. One identity is that the distance becomes just a scalar product in embedding space, and that x dot square just becomes uh, x dot square in the bigger one. Mm -hmm. So in that, you just plug it in here, and you get this action now in embedding space, which is manifestly invariant under rotation in embedding space, which is the original conformal symmetry. Now here, eta and chi are two Lagrange multipliers. This Lagrange multiplier put us on the light cone, and this Lagrange multiplier is just associated with keeping the flat space slice of embedding space, but nothing really depends on that. We are in conformal theory, it's coming the conformal operator. So we, uh, what happened? So we, what we'll do next is just uh, remove this choice of slice just a, a choice of uh, symmetry of the model. Okay. Now, well, by doing that, we introduce a lot of new gauge symmetry. Okay. Because the flat space is the projective light cone of embedding space. So now we have a new gauge symmetry, which uh, <coughs> before, okay, which acts as a local, 
reparameterization of each of these string bits, if you want. Okay? You can take each one of them and independently multiply it by some function of t. If you uh, plug it here into the kinetic term, the term where the derivative act on f instead of x automatically drop out because x squared equal to zero. So the product of x and x dot is also equal to zero. The only contribution is when the derivative acts on x itself, and then f, f cancel uh, trivially in this ratio. Okay. We introduce a new gate symmetry, which is exactly what I'm going to use to open up the kinetic term. So we can just use the same trick as we used before to separate the, the kinetic and interaction term and write it now as a sum of standard kinetic terms, where alphas are, again, Lagrange multipliers associated with this symmetry, and the way I wrote it, they satisfy the constraint that their product is equal to one. Okay? Gamma is, was exactly the same thing that was opening uh, this product into it together. One can uh, instead uh, eliminate this constraint and gamma and just think about it as is, as uh, J Lagrange multipliers. Okay. What we're going to do uh, now when kinetic thermal standard and symmetry is manifest, let's go back to the Polyakov form and fix the gauge. And the natural gauge uh, to fix is uh, first to fix all the gamma and all the alphas to one. It turns out that this is not enough because in general there are J plus one gauge symmetries here. The J uh, rescaling of each one of the coordinate and time reparameterization. If you just plug uh, alphas equal to gamma into this action, we find that there is still a, a, a remnant gauge transformation, which is a combination of rescaling and time reparameterization symmetry. And this, uh, <laughs> therefore, you will have to require another gauge fixing, which was the one that uh, we chose to do in this case, is to pick the sum of this Lagrange multiplier that imposed the Lycon constraint to one. They are, of course, charged, because they are multiplying the axes that rescale under uh, <laughs> rescaling. So then uh, we end out with the bottom line, which is the dual uh, description. Here, this R is a Lagrange multiplier that imposed the constraint that the sum of the etas equal to one. Okay. I wrote it like that because uh, it looked a bit suggestive, like this is a, a, an ADS radius. But the classical limiter is no ADS radius. Okay. So, uh, Recall that this is not just an action, we got it from gauge fixing. The gauge fixing comes with constraints. Okay. This is exactly the, the analog. I'll cut off this here. Okay, should I uh, speed up a little and try to finish at four? Okay. So that are, uh, we are so constrained that uh, just as the same as string theory, one of them is telling us that the kinetic term and the, and the uh, interaction term in the action are the same, and the other term, term tells us that the Lagrange density is constant in sigma. Here, the Lagrange density is independent of the site index k, and I call it L. Okay? So these are the two uh, Dirasoro type constraints that come out from this gauge fixing of the alphas and the gamma to one. The equation of motion is uh, written here. And he, even though here it looks like all, everyone will talk to everyone, if you take into account the constraint, you see really the dynamics that each particle only talk with its neighbors. The, the, the equation of motion is only nearest neighbor interaction. And about this uh, R square, if we take this equation of motion and multiply it by xi, we can derive an equation for R, which the bottom line is that if we start at time equal to zero, with R equal to zero, we will stay there, okay? So for, for, for if it was just a game, R would be equal to zero. And it can set consistently to zero with the equation of motion and constraints. Uh, <laughs> conserved charges. So of course, uh, there is the conformal uh, charges that are conserved. Uh, <coughs> and um, okay, here are the, the charges. The, these are the local charges. The global one is just some of them. And we choose to diagonalize the maximal uh, subset, which is of small two dimensions and two spins. The way now one solve is that uh, for j equal to two, these quantum numbers are enough to, to fix the solution uniquely. And then when one imposes the virus all constraint, one can read the spectrum. For j bigger than two, one has to uh, choose more uh, other charges to fix the solution uniquely. And then, again, virus all give you the spectrum. 
So let's see how this happened to uh, uh, the case of j equal to 2, and uh, I'll finish here. So for case j equal to 2, one can always, so we have just two points. So we have to parameterize them. And here, r, s, and phi are just some functions of time. And you can always parameterize these two points in this way. This way was uh, not chosen arbitrary. Uh, this is like the time, if you want, in global ADS, it was correspond to uh, dilatation. So symmetry fixed uh, them uniquely, their dependence on time. Here tau is just the rescaling of, of time. And you see that uh, phi, the angle here, is really measuring the spin. It's linear in tau, and s is linear in delta. Okay. So these are just the, co the coordinates that are conjugate to the charges that we use to diagonal. So this is fixed the uh, solution uh, uniquely, and then one imposed the Virasoro constraint, and the Virasoro constraint becomes this constraint that automatically reproduces the spectrum we had before. Next one, uh, so this is the Virasoro constraint. Next one, uh, I want to uh, consider the correlation function. The correlation function is a shooting problem. We start with these two particles at some time equal to zero and let them evolve. They start to circle around each other and you want to find the time after which they arrive into a position where the two conformal cost ratios were what I called before theta and rho. And uh, when you do that and plug it back into the action, you indeed reproduce the correlation function. Uh, okay, maybe more about this tomorrow, not at all. Integrability. Again? We can respond to this uh, for next time. Okay, integrability can prove that it's classical integrable. So let me just uh, summarize. Uh, <coughs> well, this is a future direction, and the first future direction will be happen tomorrow. We will uh, here we just derive the classical model that capture the theory at strong coupling. When we just fish chain model, all one does is solve an equation of motion and constraint, plug it back to the action, and uh, compute the correlation function in the spectrum. So we'll do tomorrow and go and quantize it. And uh, a priori, it's, it's highly nonlinear, so it's not clear how to quantize it. It's not a trivial task. And one thing, is, uh, another thing to do is to include magnons. What we call magnons is operators that are only ch also charged under phi two rotations. I will not uh, discuss this uh, in this talk, but this is uh, almost a trivial uh, uh, change in what I, I did before. What we want uh, to do uh, next is to study how how this uh, chains, how the spring split, what are the string vertex uh, in the bulk. And another thing is to uh, develop integrability techniques for computing correlation functions. It will be a bit about that at the last talk. More generally, what I would like to do once understanding this uh, holography for this model uh, completely is try to go back and, because this model is continuously connected to n equal to four, try to use it to understand holography for n equal to four. And here there's done out to be a systematic expansion around this model that takes us back to n equal to four. For example, one can now start to include order by order perturbation in lambda. For example, that this graph billing operator has a systematic expansion in, in lambda, and one can now try to do it. any point in perturbation theory that the model is non-unitary. Um, <coughs> so it's, it's basically given a, a finite tension to the string and starting to see also the, how, the, how the piece uh, come in between. Uh, one can generalize it to this free parameter family of uh, fishnet uh, CFTs and uh, particular the supersymmetric one, they are analogs in uh, six and uh, three dimensions, which I expect to uh, follow a similar pattern. But actually, these type of diagrams, you can study them in any dimension with the conformal diagrams. And maybe one very uh, popular example is the SYK model, which is another case of this, exactly the same type of diagrams, but in 1D. I can try to repeat the same uh, thing there. I'll stop here. <laughs>